I'd like to officially welcome everyone to the College of Complexes tonight. My name is Jim. I'll be hosting the event tonight for you. Um, the first thing that you've got to remember is that we're going to have a brief announcements period, followed by a uh, question, followed by our speaker who will present, which is his name is Jonathan. He's going to be talking about progressive legislation. After that, we'll have a question and answer period, followed by a rebuttal period. We have to finish off by uh, 7.45 because the restaurant closes at 8 o'clock. Again, my name is Tim, and we'll be ready in a few minutes. And we'll be starting here. All right, Charlie, go ahead and get started with the announcements. You might want to try a few adjustments on that microphone. Charlie, get start with the announcements. We got it. It's still not terribly good. Well, Charlie will get well. We'll deal with it. Yeah, but yeah the, the, I'm asking you to. The microphone you're speaking on now is best than the, the official one. Yeah, it is, but we got another one here that I could put up closer to. Give me a second. I'm going to make an adjustment now. Give him time to do it. Do that, Charlie. You can do the announcement. I didn't hear that. He needs me to help him with that. Oh. As soon as I get this damn thing fucking. Hey, Charlie, are you going to pay any tuition tonight? No, he's not. He's, he's never. Sure. Bear with me, please. Fuck. I don't. Damn, uh, damn cords again. Shit. Gosh darn. I know. Charlie, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I'm going to move the mic. But it's Jonathan. I'm concerned about I want to listen to. We'll, get, we'll hear Jonathan tonight, too. Just make you figure the mic. Okay, Jonathan. You're going to use both. We're gonna eat I'll be the moderator soon as well. And uh, we just opened up. All right, Charlie, proceed with the announcements. All right. Welcome to meeting number three thousand seven hundred and fifty of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Um, we've got ten upcoming programs. Ten of them. And although I'm not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for each of these very quickly. On January 27th, Kathy Powers will be talking about handicaps and disabled accessibility in the city of Chicago. She's getting together photographs of this with a focus on public transit. On February the 3rd, um, uh, we're having a gentleman from our other campus is going to put together a, a, a review of the Biden administration. And he says we should be riding with Biden. Um, Ken Williams, very good PowerPoint presentation. On uh, February the 10th, Jim Fetzer. I'm sorry. All right, Charlie, go ahead. We can't hear you. Charlie, we, we what, can't hear you. What did you not hear? Right. Did, you, did I leave off? We just were, were having trouble with your audio here. That's all. Keep talking. February 10th. I know we're at February 10th. Charlie, are you there? All right, on February 10th, we have Jim Fetzer. That thing we didn't know about Sandy Hook. On February 17th, we have more on primitive society and the class society with feudalism, capitalism in the future. On February 24th, we have moral messages and absolutes from Don Quixote with Professor Robert Lichtenberg. 
and then and then on the following month, we have a Holocaust and genocides with Dr. Mike Goes, who uh, will be talking about uh, our our three uh, short videos on the topic. He's going to be talking about uh, the Holocaust and genocide. Should be an interesting presentation. On March 9th and 30th, they're open. On March 16th, we have Justin Tucker coming back for our uh, Libertarian Party election. And then on March 23rd, a, uh, Justin's, also, Justin's also speaking about uh, a collection of political illustrations based on social media, a dark Libertarian stash. And then on the following month, April 6th, we have some special Earth Day speakers on September 6th. Andy Anderson's coming back with the uh, with uh, some more information on how to save the planet. On April 13th and 20th, we have open. And then on April 27th, why Joe Biden is the worst pres candidate president our country has seen since Jimmy Carter and why any American needs a Republican. Any Republican to our next president. Okay, uh, we're up. Charlie, I don't know what happened, but you weren't coming through. Um, uh, Jonathan, if you're ready, let's get start talking and uh, get your, get your uh, presentation going. Jonathan, are you there? All right, well, um, all right. Another sound check. Kelvin, can you hear me? All right. Norma, can you hear me? I can hear Charlie? you. Okay, good. Well, Charlie, Charlie will know. All right. I can hear you fine. Thank you. Okay. Um, while we wait for Jonathan, Andy's got a quick announcement for us, too, if he wants to make it real quick. Okay, Andy, if you want to come on up and make your fast announcement, go ahead. Tim, neither of those are, are on the podium are working. Oh. All right, loud, loud, Andy. Okay. i just like to make an announcement on one book that is current. It, it helps people understand what our media is doing. It's called Into the Buzzsaw, written by Christine Borgeson. This was actually published in 2004. It describes what happens to journalists on mainstream media, print, radio, newspaper, if they try to tell the truth in America on certain things. So America, a third, a good third of voters in America are living in a bubble of mythology, believing things that aren't real. And right now, the mainstream media is not telling us that the megachurches are calling on all good Christians to go to the polls and reinstall Trump as the best Christian leader we ever had. And they're calling on the, uh, the expulsion of the evil people that are running our government right now. One last note. Remember this name and look it up. Chris Avell. Chris Avell. Common Green's website has an article today. Chris Avell is the pastor of a church in Ohio. And he got arrested for opening the doors of the church to let homeless people in that were starving and freezing to death. The city says, you can't be practicing the principles of Jesus in this church to help the sick and the poor. Where do you think you are? We have rules in Ohio. If you don't have the proper paperwork for a church, you can't let homeless people come in, even if they're freezing and starving to death in some zero weather. So this book describes how the media has brought us to this point where we're just this far different from the laws that were brought down in Nazi Germany back in the 30s and 40s. We'll talk about that later in the final time. Okay, introduce Jonathan. Introduce Jonathan. Jonathan. Our president, president, presentation tonight will be done by Jonathan Bart, who is uh, putting together his notes and thoughts right now as we speak. So let's give a warm welcome to John. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Woo. All right, Jonathan. Hello, Jonathan. 
Just talk normally, Johnny, Jonathan. Good evening, everybody. We can hear you, just talk normally. Uh, happy 2024, you beautifully rowdy bunch of peace, love, equality, transparency, justice, and solidarity, advocating, organizing, demanding, and living carbon-based life forms. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't make it two weeks ago to hear Satan speak. That must have been a good talk. But Satan will be back this summer in Chicago, so we'll get another chance for him to speak in Chicago uh, on the campaign trail. And that's not a partisan statement at all. Both Satan's will be here trying to get your vote. Uh, I'd like to say that tonight's the uh, best speaker of the year thus far, but we're one week early for the best speaker of the year. Uh, so uh, taking my time, I'd like to uh, encourage everybody to either be on Zoom or listen on their phone or be in person to uh, Kathy Powers giving a talk called Disability Accessibility in the City with a focus on public transit. Uh, meeting number 3751 next week is going to be outstanding. She's going to talk about the transit system in Chicago and uh, how uh, accessibility issues are so important to all of us. So I can't wait for all y'all to show up next week for Kathy Powers. <laughs> This is from a book by Studs Kirk Turkle, uh, the great Chicagoan historian, journalist, uh, organizer, and overall mensch. It's called The Great Divide, Second Thoughts on the American Dream. In 1934, Sherwood Anderson took a trip across much of the country. Puzzled America, he called this book. That the hitchhikers he picked up in his jalopy were less puzzled than their nomadic descendants. At least they made a stab at unraveling it. He found a hunger for belief, a determination to believe in one another, in a leadership we're likely, likely to get out of democracy. A hunger for belief is certainly no less today than it was then. It is the nature of belief that may have changed in the time lapse, new phenomena have taken over our lives and psyches. The Cold War, the sanctity of the military, union busting beyond precedent, encouraged by the cravenness of labor's food bars, along with televised sound bites offered with the regularity of a cuckoo clock and a press that has assiduously followed the dictum of, Ray, of Sam Rayburn to get along, go along. As a result, reflective conversations concerning these matters have become suspect, or at best, the abdication of odd birds, vestigial remainders of a long gone past. A daughter of Appalachia may have put her finger on it. We've gotten away from our imaginations. The reason we're image struck is because we don't like who we are. The more we get over this fake stuff, the more chance we've got to keep our sanity and our self-respect. Christopher Lash, in reflecting on the 30s, said as much in a wholly different context. Whatever else you may say about the New Deal, there was inventiveness. All points of view were entertained during the New Deal. In short, during the crisis, imaginations were called upon. This it was Sherwood Anderson sensed in his hard traveling a hope as well as resilience despite adversity among those he encountered. Something trickled up as well as dawn, down. Long live imagination. It was a banner carried by the students of Paris during the tempestuous year 1968. 
It was an idea that crossed the waters, undoubtedly misused and abused in some quarters. Nonetheless, it was a banner of strange and exhilarating device, not unlike the one borne by Longfellow's youth, Excelsior. Yes, please. So tonight it's about long live imagination. And I see them. No, I see them. Yes. Thanks. You're welcome. I want to quickly go through January 20th in history. Uh, this is the day that Lead Belly. The famous blues guitarist vocalist was born. He wrote that famous song, Good Night Irene, and Rock Island Line. Uh, famous actor Rain Wilson from The Office. George Burns was born on this day. Actor, comedian, singer, vaudeville performer, and television, radio, and film. Famous for his movies, Going in Style, Oh God, and The Sunshine Boys, one of my favorite films. Today's Federico Fellini's birthday, the famous director and scriptwriter of famous films like La Strada, Knights of Cambria, Juliet of the Spirits, Eight and a Half, La Dolce Vita, Fellini's Casanova, I, Vitaldo, Loni. Today's Patricia Neal's birthday, the actress in the Iconic film, The Day the Earth Stood Still, and also another one of my favorite films. The subject was Roses, which she won Best Actress in 1963. Richard Henry Lee, the revolutionary patriot, the signatory of the Declaration of Independence birthday is today. Jimmy Cobb, the jazz drummer for Miles Davis. Art Johnson, comedian, born in Chicago. David Lynch, famous director and actor. So one of his famous films I saw as a kid that taught me about empathy was called The Elephant Man. He also directed uh, Wild at Heart, Mulholland Drive, Blue Velvet, Inland Empire. It's Edward nice. Hirsch, the Chicago poet. He wrote For the Sleepwalkers, Wild Gratitude, On Love. Today is Chicago White Sox manager, world champion in 2005, Ozzy Guillen's birthday. Happy birthday, Ozzy. Woo! Wish you were still the manager. Uh, today's Ron Harper's birthday, a uh, three-time champion with the Chicago Bulls and uh, twice more with the LA Lakers. Today's Nick Anderson's birthday, another famous Chicago uh, NBA legend. Today is Questlove Amir Thompson's birthday, the producer, drummer, director, band leader, filmmaker, and Academy Award winner for his film, Summer of Soul. Mm -hmm. And today is the day that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was inaugurated for his fourth term in 1945, which just goes to show uh, Term limits sometimes are a great thing. Sometimes I'm not so against the absence of term limits. Those are some famous birthdays. Quicksand, or bear trap, or firing squad, or lava pit. In a civic crisis of a great and dangerous sort, the common herd is not privately anxious about the rights and wrongs of the matter. It's only anxious to be on the winning side. In the North before the war, those who opposed slavery were despised and ostracized and insulted by the patriots. Then by and by, the patriots went over to the other side and thenceforth their attitudes became patriotism. There are two kinds of patriotism. The first kind of patriotism is monarchical, 
patriotism. And the second kind of patriotism is we the people's patriotism. I'm paraphrasing. In one case, the government and the king may rightfully furnish us their notions of patriotism. In the other, neither the government nor the entire nation is privileged to dictate to any individual what the form of their patriotism shall be. The gospel of the monarchical patriotism is the king can do no wrong. We have adopted it with all its servility with an unimportant change in the wording. Our country is right or wrong. We have thrown away the most valuable asset we have, the individual right to oppose both flag and country when we believe them to be in the wrong. We've thrown it away and with it, all that was really respectable about the grotesque and laughable word, patriotism. That was Mark Twain from Mark Twain's notebook, the chapter closing years. And that perfectly encapsulates how tens of billions of Americans feel right now. Uh, we want to live in a country where we have the right to oppose both flag and government. Uh, both corporate powers to be and political powers to be. Uh, we don't have to want to choose one or the other. And that sentiment is all the more stronger the more our money is squandered away, our trust is betrayed, and our talents are not utilized fully. So the question I ask tonight see all is this why is there a perception that the only way to defeat the bad is to opt for the not as bad as bad but still not good i'll repeat that question so everybody at zoom world can hear it one more time and in person why is there a perception in our country the beloved united states of america that the only way to defeat the bad is to opt for the not as bad as bad but still not good yeah. Acts who peddle this mythology insist that voters must only vote for a Democrat or a Republican because the Republican or the Democrat is so unbeatable and at the end, that the end is near unless we all agree to support a safe, slow, sleepy reformist on the other side of the aisle. Well, that's what it is. Meetings is. One full at a time, please. It reminds me of writing my term paper senior year in high school. When we're preparing to write our papers, we go to the library and then we learn about what topics we can focus on. My senior year topic was how World War II impacted the lives of people in Europe, Russia, and the United States. When we're writing it, we need a wide variety of material to write an accurate, high quality work of research. And the library is a great place. I love our libraries in this country. It provides lots of sources to write a good paper. But what if the library is nearly empty and hardly has any books at all? What if the library only has two books in the entire building? And what if the only two topics of those two books we could receive information about were how to fall in love with group things and how to surrender to peer pressure or power pressure for that matter? This is exactly how we were bamboozled into believing something good happened from 1981 to 2001. The greatest gifts to the disaster of Reaganism and imperialism weren't only what deranged Republicans passed into law during the 1980s, it was also what only opposition Democrats, Democrats in name only, I might be called, capitulated away in the 1990s, policy that even neocons didn't attempt to oppose on us. Now that conscious surrender of how hard won ground of progressive legislation, the era of big government is over, there is no such thing as society, and don't make the perfect, the enemy of the good, to borrow from two heads of state from both Great Britain and America respectively normalized what then at the beginning of the 21st century became a familiar statement for profit addicts and privatization bullies to dismissively respond to the needs of we the people. Policies that only four decades earlier 
were so highly respected by both major parties and beloved by we the constituents that they were considered to be untouchable for any kind of budget cuts or reduction as national priorities. The core problem of the crisis is that oligarchs do not deserve power. Oligarchs are not members of the left. And even if someone strongly opposes the right wing policy makers taking power, whether they are an oligarchic independent or an oligarchic Democrat, they don't qualify as what most people on earth consider to be the left. Now I'm immediately in the beginning of the talk showing my bias. I feel like for my values, uh, we've seen too many governments, including our own, go too far to the right over the last five or six decades. So uh, that's where I am. Uh, so I look very forward to y'all's rebuttals. <laughs> we disagree and think we've gone too left because I love those dialogues where we can find common ground and agreement. You'll, you'll, you'll be hearing it from me, Jonathan. Where, Don't where, worry. We go, where we go too far off the rails in either direction, I'm not a partisan. If I can learn something new from the right, I appreciate it. I respect it. And, uh, you know, call me out if uh, I've, not done good research on this. For the last five decades, we've gone right, and it's been a complete disaster for the majority of working class and middle class people. Don't allow yourself to be duped into surrendering your sovereignty to wolves in sheep's clothing or wolves without disguises. They are both unworthy of the privilege of speaking for us. We must reject them all, no matter what ruse they fall out of their hats to fool us. Reject oligarchs with your voice, with your affiliation, with your work, with your vote, with your money, with your organizing, with your trust, and with who you are as a human being. I'm going to go out on a limb with this next sentence. It's as easy as not shopping at Walmart or Target. And I shop at Walmart and Target, so i got, I got to improve on this. Not logging on to Amazon or Facebook Meta, which I do also, so I have some self-improvement to do. Not riding with Uber or Lyft. I ride with Uber or Lyft, so I have to get better on this. Instead, let's shop at our local independently operated owned businesses. Let's log on to DuckDuckGo and search for made in the USA products. Let's ride either with a union taxi or if at all possible, ride on the local public bus or public train on a very special Saturday, invite some good friends who have a motor vehicle and pay for gas. Refuse to support oligarchs. In 1987, Prime Minister Thatcher of Britain, one of the closest allies to the imperialist Reagan administration of the United States said this in a speech. And each time I read uh, Prime Minister Thatcher's statement that some speechwriter wrote, obviously, uh, I'll translate it in real talk, real world translation. So Prime Minister Thatcher said this, they are casting their problems at society. And you know, there's no such thing as society. Here's the real talk translation of that first part of the speech. The public are demanding honest, wise, diligent, supportive, legitimate leadership and absolutely refuse to suffer public officials who fail to enact legislation that improves quality of life and ensures real freedom, especially the freedom for workers to strike and the public is expected to now unquestionably accept that their legislatures have no responsibility to serve the common good. So you can see it's already setting up. Uh, we don't have any accountability in the most powerful, wealthy, influential, influential uh, places of society. Next part of the speech from Prime Minister Thatcher goes as follows. There are individual men and women, and there are families. No government can do anything except through people, and people must look after themselves first. Here's the real talk translation of that part of the speech. There are wage slaves and more wage slaves and suckers who naively believe that wage slavery had been abolished, that, uh, excuse me, slavery had been abolished long ago in its physical, violent terrorist form. Public officials are not accountable to the constituents. They're only accountable to rich donors. The public are not here on earth to live happy, healthy, and free lives. The public are here to be exhausted, scared, surveyed, propagandized, desperate, 
divided wage slaves and are to bow down to the rule of all the global economic royalists, oligarchs, warmongers, jingoists, sweatshop bosses, cartel dons, and exploitation masters, etc. Next part of the speech goes as follows. It is our duty to look after ourselves and then also to look after our neighbors. Real talk translation, from my humble perspective, for that part goes as follows. It is your orders to obey, you meaning the people, and to be property of those who sit on the thrones of power, meaning the ruling class. To surrender your common sense, to forfeit your rights to indulge in fear and adhere to an unwritten rule of cowardice. You must start to just accept the new normal, that the charity or the lottery or miracles or magic have replaced most governments of the world. And therefore, they no longer should be expected to provide essential services or supports or safety nets or anything that improves the lives of the public. F justice, F the planet, F equality. I'm sorry for my language for everybody in Zoom here. F human rights, F privacy, F kindness, F democracy, F peace. F organizers, F system change advocates, F dissidents, F journalists, F civil society groups, F pensioners, F retirees, F seniors, F people with disabilities, F students, F families, F community, F workers, F unions, F people, F you, meaning we the masses. We are the godsidents, the god ministers, the god chancellors, the supremely godly leaders, and the god CEOs. And y'all are nothing more than the props and the scenery for us to easily amuse ourselves 24-7, 365. You're the masses who lost the big game of history, and we're the ruling class who are the victors. So hail our jackassery through eternity. Mm -hmm. Now, does that sound familiar to anyone? Yeah. <laughs> and they are very slick, very stealthy, very clever. They don't outright say that, but you know they want to. They make, make it a, a lot more time and energy efficient to not have to do these cartwheels, what they say behind closed doors and what they say in public in front of cameras and the microphone. So my premise for tonight's talk is very simple. No one on earth wants this, except the embarrassingly wealthy, financially powerful, addictively influential members of the psychotic country club of the global godsidents, otherwise known as the ruling class. They have, through the use of the two major political parties, not honored the responsibility and duty to secure the blessings of liberty and the responsibility and duty to form a more perfect union. And since we're on the preamble, let's just read it out loud one more time. This is the preamble of our country, the United States of America. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America which they saw their brothers and sisters lose, lose their lives, lose their limbs to defend against the throne on the other side of the Atlantic to make us a little bit more sovereign. I still, in my historical context, feel like it, it was one ruling class seceding from another ruling class. So there was still uh, intolerably violent and uh, crimes against humanity, uh, widespread structural, uh, basically terrorism against the most vulnerable members of society uh, conducted by those very people who established the government. So that's another talk for another day. But it was a little bit closer where we can have true self-determination for all 340 million Americans, comparably. We got a long way to go is what I'm saying. That was just a small speed bump. We still got to leap forward to be an actual functioning civilization. So here's a list of some of the most damaging ways by which their elite system 
a combination of oligarchy, plutocracy, privatization, secrecy, militarism, censorship, propaganda, ecocide, cronyism, nepotism, systemic oppression, cartel logic, imperialism, religious fundamentalism, totalitarianism, and worse, has conducted actions which has over several decades surrendered away hard won ground on popular legislation that successfully improves the quality of our lives. And additionally, how that cruel deliberate betrayal and undemocratic reversal of force has imposed devastating attacks that have predictably caused poverty, suffering, and chaos in a long list of communities, both here in the United States and all over the globe. The list includes failure to ensure and recognize agricultural workers and home service workers and community service workers equally having the rights of other workers. The failure to build infrastructure, the failure to ensure and respect the people's right to free speech, the failure to ensure and respect the people's right to free and fair elections, the failure to ensure and respect the people's right of freedom of the press, the failure to ensure and respect the people's right to assemble, the failure to ensure and respect the people's right to petition the government for a list of grievances, the failure to provide the people affordable, safe, quality health care and education and job training and housing and human services for the needs of seniors and people with disabilities and workers and child care and clean water and nutritional food and legal aid and supports for retirement with dignity for our seniors, our retirees, our elders, many of them veterans who fought for freedoms that now no longer exist. The failure to ensure and respect the people's right to a timely trial before a jury of one's community members and peers. The failure to ensure and respect the people's right to organize and form a union. The failure to ensure and respect the people's right to privacy. The failure to protect the people from economic waste, fraud, and abuse. The failure to adhere to domestic laws and conduct civics with transparency. The failure to adhere to international laws. The failure to ensure and respect human rights and the right to self-determination. The failure to practice peaceful relations with local and international peoples and to foster cooperation with local and international peoples and the failure to recognize and respect new ideas, or as I like to say, the best ideas aren't ideas at all, they're ideas, perspectives, and leadership. When either someone who has a disproportionate influence on decision-making of those who are in public office, or when someone who is in public office knowingly, deliberately, and consistently betrays us, deceives us, impoverishes us, stifles us, marginalizes us, patronizes us, endangers us, propagandizes us, censors us, demonizes us, deplatforms us, curses us, enslaves us, and obstructs almost all means to live and evolve, common sense sounds our internal emergency alarms. <laughs> and right now our trees and alarms are roaring a blood curdling volume level sound. We the people know that it's our time right now. We can't ignorance our way to achieve enlightenment and growth. We can't lie our way to truth and science. We can't insult our way to civility and maturity. We can't denial our way to discipline and self-improvement. We can't trifle our way to self-sufficiency. We can't censor our way to a free exchange of ideas. We can't folk shame our way to foster a society of new voices and new visions. We can't hate our way to coexistence and respect. We can't addiction our way to healing, health, and focus. We can't ecocide our way to conservation and sustainability. We can't secrecy our way to transparency and awareness. We can't wage stagnation and debt trap our way to be economically independent and financially free. We can't oppression our way to autonomy and dignity. We can't plutocracy our way to equality and a high quality of life. We can't corruption our way to ethics and rule of law. We can't war our way to peace and cooperation. We can't oversee our way to liberation and privacy. 
We can't tyranny our way to sovereignty and justice. We are engaged, informed, communicating, listening, brainstorming, capacity growing, 21st century fully empowered people. We might say that we are a life loving people. We love our lives and work in solidarity. We don't just love a diversity of civic ideas, we love being here on the earth. And when the ruling class dehumanizes us, it is absolutely clear that they have a profound lack of love for life. You refuse to ever allow suicidal beings to order us to give up because they have decided to give up on being alive. We are we the people of planet earth, not status quacks, of the cesspool of the ruling class. The world we live in doesn't live in us. What lives in us are our dreams. Our dreams are what there's often no name for. Our dreams are at the center of who we are. Honey is just that tree, so don't let the fallen trees become who we are. Be a living world of what we are organizing for, to demand that our dreams' best ideas are the foundation of our existence. Tell me why do the rich see the rich see richer? It's an out of global picture. Wealth and wealth is a classic picture. But we fail to notice we're drinking spiked elixir. Lies in war, a DC picture. Those good old boys excused because Christian. Profits and propaganda, a massive trick turn. So tell me why do the songs sound like filler? Crawl into a shell crushed under. Move into a box dozed over. Work a job if you can find one in the stampede. Into communities capsize where rooms gentrify. Here's where we learn to lose our lease. Slipping out of the cuffs and kicking. Out of the shards then jumping. Out the squad harder than your hardest punch. And the omens are obvious. Ludonomics never blossoming. Pushing us farther than our farthest run. It's a permanent mark, it's never coming off. Here does it expand, it fails to evolve. It's a permanent mark, it's never coming off. That's no marching band, it's a wrecking ball. Little one shaking brand new chain link, smiling like she never knew any love else. Cut the death nails, let the birth bells resound. Cajun cattails, cornstalk spider web strings. Laugh like she's never known any joy else. Living at half strength for so long, lost count. And it's surveillance on a sinking island spending. It's our patience so quietly defending. When does a hard time start becoming limitless? Bust out all these suffocating situations. Cast our bread upon the waters tired of waiting. When does a long time start becoming infinite? Yeah, it's a permanent mark. It's never coming off. Here the big ideas expand, yet we ideas fail to evolve. Yeah, it's a permanent mark. It's never coming off. That's no marching band. We all know it's a wrecking ball. Is it something in the way of the bucket line? Pour water on fire instead of fuel. These rituals, they cripple and intoxicate. And it'll take the lap away from our lips. It'll take the run out of our legs. These replicas we confront to stop the day. So now we cherish what's found where money isn't. Now we perish what drowns us in division. Such a thing as peace and such a thing as faith. Just like the earth out from under our feet, just like the ground no longer beneath, and where the two meet is a fragile place. It's a permanent mark, it's never coming off. It's a general strike, it's time, y'all. It's the people's heart, we will never be bought. Clear path to the light of that burning star. That's my talk. Thank you for being here tonight. Okay. Um all right, who's got questions for Jonathan tonight?
All right, we're going to entertain questions from our audience. I can, I can moderate. All right, go ahead. And if you could take the microphone from the computer and hand it to the people who want to have a question. Who's got a question? Who's the first questioner? Um, yeah, I'll have a question. Um, Jonathan, I'd like to know why you think the Reagan era was so uh, economically deprived when almost all the statistics say that uh, we have had more prosperity and more things than ever before under the Reagan administration, under the uh, admittance of free market capitalism. I quote the systematic reduction since 1980 of uh, abject poverty going from 25% down to 10%, and of course, several other benefits. Can you comment, please? Even if those things are true, we got closer to extinction because of militarism. So if I were, which I don't agree that it was a good economic time for the majority of people, uh, Reagan just started so many known wars and unknown covert wars all over the earth that we were uh, lucky to see the 90s. So, uh, and my father worked for the Department of Energy uh, at that time. And if you were a fly on the wall and heard the conversations between him and his colleagues at that cafeteria lunch table when I was a little uh, 9 and 10 and 11 and 12 and 13 and 14 year old boy, I would pin your ears back how much corruption uh, happens when you have somebody who thinks that murdering innocent uh, workers and human rights organizers and priests and nuns all over the world is acceptable behavior from the most powerful government in history. So uh, it's interesting you mentioned Reagan. Fairly Lab is a well-known place in Batavia, Illinois, as is CERN in Switzerland and Daisy in Hamburg, Germany, respectively, where we were so privileged because dad uh, got a physics degree from the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana and got to uh, help with energy research all over the world. And, uh, you know, these dignitaries and people who want to be head of state or think they already are head of state or are head of state would often come to Fermi Lab because it's a big budget. It's an unlimited uh, blank check. So uh, dad would sometimes uh, be in the room when a bunch of these uh, folks that he worked with wanted to see uh, the Grand Booba come to town. So, uh, you know, one time my dad was there and uh, they had a moment where uh, I had a brief conversation. He tried to explain what he did at Fermi Lab where they shoot in a gigantic tunnel underground uh, particles and they smash against a piece of uh, hardened surface where they could uh, be observed under a high uh, Lee powered microscope to see even smaller particles. And then you, uh, through that research over, over several decades, literally learn what the building block is for everything in the universe, uh, find out what matter of the entire uh, everything, vastness of space and the cosmos is. So as you can see, uh, when he was meeting uh, Ronnie, he's trying to explain to him how that exists exactly works. And you can see uh, Reagan is kind of confused. He's not really getting the concept. My dad's trying the best to explain to him how uh, the electron synchrotron research works. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much how I feel about Ronald Reagan. Oh, he's, got he's, a, he's a really, really interesting guy. Born in Illinois. Okay, go ahead. It's, it's, it's... <laughs> Yeah, I'm uh, very inspired by uh, organizers all over the country and all over the world. Uh, to uh, remind us all that the onus is on us. Uh, the most powerful tool in our toolbox is not voting on election day, although I do encourage everybody to either uh, vote a third party candidate, either uh, 
the Libertarian or Green or People's Party or uh, right in that right in space, no confidence vote. Get rid of these donkeys and elephants because, before the planet is gone. Uh, so organizers inspire us for the civil rights movement. And just to give you a, a deeper perspective through an example, the United States government is like a motor vehicle driving on the road on an extremely rainy or icy or snowy night with its lights off, right? And the drivers are blissfully unconscious about all the possible consequences of their actions. So we, the organizers, are always ignored whenever we attempt to knock on the driver's side of the window when the vehicle is temporarily stopped at a red light or a stop sign or a traffic jam and tell them that eventually something dangerous will result from their actions if they don't change their behavior immediately, which they of course have absolutely no capacity to do or yield to a new perspective, a new vision and a new generation of leadership before it's too late, which they automatically dismiss us as naive and altruistic and not how the real, real world works. So, uh, yeah, long live imagination of the organizers, because that's the only reason our country is still uh, not completely collapsed from within and falling apart. It's the organizers. And people who don't think of themselves as organizers, it's always the most humble, the best, most effective organizers. Aretha Franklin had arguably the greatest voice of all time, and she often was self-conscious with close friends and family that she didn't think that she had a good voice. Now, if you've ever heard an album by Aretha Franklin, uh, you know it'll bring you to tears if you're in that moment. So I want the people who are the most humble to just get a little bit of fire for justice underneath their hearts and souls to become organizers. Just once every five to seven weeks, start a uh, grassroots organization in your local bookstore or library or faith organization or nonprofit or union hall or bookstore or public park. Uh, it's the voices that we haven't heard yet that we most need to hear. Okay, uh, David, you got the next question, and we'll go to you. Then Charlie. Yes, Justin. What was your dad's view of the man of J. Robert Oppenheimer? Uh, they felt like that was progress at the time. Uh, of course, when you have only the people who own everything using that technology, uh, it's one step forward, a thousand steps backwards. So uh, we need energy for 8 billion people on this planet. Agreed. What kind of energy? That's a discussion we never have internationally because a lot of people stand to lose power and wealth from their companies if we go in a new direction. A, direction that I don't think is necessarily uh, controversial if we value not becoming a self-mutating organism. So if you like to not be extinct, maybe some of this addiction to fossil fuels has gone off in the wrong direction. And I agree, uh, maybe if we had ordinary everyday people like the vision for Athenian uh, democracy, just have uh, people so, uh, selected for public office to lot uh, randomly, uh, we might have a more reflective of our values not to have uh, technology that is reckless and it always happens to be affecting people who are working class and middle class and the wealthy people who own those places are never living right next door to them and never drink the water from that water supply. They're always uh, ready to go to some mountainous region or some island and uh, you know, from where dad worked, uh, they didn't just like Fermi for its energy research, they like tunnels. Let me just put it out there. So the rolling class like their tunnels and their mountains and their islands, okay. especially when stuff goes down. All right, we get started. Go ahead. Dad, do you think it's necessary to have a Um, Repeat the question, please. She asked if, uh, is it the Supreme Court's uh, duty to uh, try Trump? Yes. 
Yeah. Justified. So basically, to give him support. Yeah. Either through through their decisions or other means decisions, should they stay out of supporting political candidates yeah. publicly? Should they? Yeah. Is this is this a movie to take back the ballot? Um, I understand what time we live in. That people really, really think that Donald Trump is the uh, greatest threat to the history of the world. I understand that. Uh, I detest what I would determine to be uh, fanatically violent, hateful, uh, totalitarian, dishonest, oppressive uh, individuals who are you know, modern modern day example of everything, what not to do. But uh, if you have the opposition party who can't uh, provide anything as an alternative that the people decide that they wanna show up to vote because they've seen betrayal on the other side too, you got a real problem of maybe we should not vote for either of them. So I see it as half right when people say Donald Trump is the problem with this country. It's my position that the Supreme Court uh, should be very disturbed and actively trying to prevent people like him and Joe Biden from ever having public office because they both are destroying this country. All right, Shirley, you're next with the next question. And this planet. Yes, Jonathan. One second, Charlie. And just to give you some background, there's two books you can read about Trump or Biden that uh, could explain why I feel that way, because I don't want to just give a soundbite that uh, I haven't done my research on this. There's a book by David K. Johnston called The Making of Trump, which pretty much explains he isn't qualified to be a doo-doo scooper in a one-person town. And then there's a book called Yesterday's Man, The Case Against Joe Biden by Franco Marcetich, which also uh, points out why uh, I feel, in my opinion, uh, Sleepy Joe isn't qualified to be a doo-doo scooper in another one-person town. Go ahead, Charlie. Yes, Jonathan, I've been a lobbyist for a number of years and if I look at legislation that's been the agenda that's been accomplished. And I look at the Democratic Party and they passed some very good progressive legislation raising minimum wage. They passed all sorts of environmental protection laws and they've done all kinds of funding they've passed to improve public transit infrastructure so I don't perceive any reason why I should not vote Democratic. Can you tell me so what is the wrong with, they seem to be doing everything uh, that the progressive would want. Thank you very much for the question, Charlie. I'm so glad you mentioned policies that have been championed by the progressive caucus for years. If only when a Democratic wins, some of the members of the progressive caucus could be given cabinet positions. One of the most recent champions of the Progressive Caucus, a senator from Vermont, uh, was uh, uh, actively lobbying three years ago to get the Secretary of Labor position. They were actively asking the incoming new administration if he, one of the most popular people in the history of this country, a Progressive Caucus uh, lifer, and the second most popular candidate in the Democratic primaries could have one cabinet position that he had worked his whole life on that topic, labor issues of workers' rights, collective bargaining, unions being stronger, everything. What did the administration do? They told him, no, you're not popular enough. I love the progressive caucus wing of the Democratic Party. Which which is used to steer us into electoral politics and take us away from system change. That's the problem with the DNC. Uh, if you hear some of the quotes by Debbie Wasserman Schultz in 2016, they think it's okay and within the rules to actively sabotage the people who have the values that most reflect working class and middle class peoples. That's not just something that I disagree with them. There's a word for that and it's called treason. So, uh, Jonathan, I'm not, I'm not against Democrats or Republicans. I, Democrats, Democrats, Democrats. Debbie Watson, I personally dealt with Debbie Watson on several occasions and met with her personally. 
And she's through all kinds of lofty stuff. What are you talking about? You were impressed by her uh, honesty and integrity and dignity? Yeah. In I regards to electoral uh, proceedings? Yeah, I had my photo taken with her. You want it just posted? Give it to you. Well, you know, I'm in Illinois, not Florida. So maybe uh, there's a difference Debbie Wasserman Schultz in Florida. You know, I don't disrespect her personally. I think she's bad for civics. I think that uh, the way that when Keith Ellison wanted to be head of the DNC and at the last second, uh, very high profile people from Chicago at the 11th hour came in and made sir with somebody other than Keith Ellison. And you can read uh, interviews with Nomiki Kunst online about this. Uh, it's quite clear that the progressive caucus is to be seen and not heard by the head of the DNC, and that is corruption. That is not in keeping with the values of ordinary, everyday Americans. We're supposed to constantly have new voices, new ideas, new leadership, new vision. So uh, it is what it is. It's Can I have one just follow up? Debbie Wasserman was the chief of the Democrats. And they, what do you mean? She got in that position. So how did she get looked over? Okay, Charlie, that's your last bet on this question. Doesn't make any sense. Repeat the question one more time real quick, Charlie. She was given the leadership position of the Democratic Party. I don't know precisely what you're talking about. Right. Was by not, the people, not by we the people. Exactly my point. Be the people of the LIA. <clears throat> I okay. mean, the, the DNC is coming to town this summer, and I look forward them to passing some policy that I would be prompted to hold my nose and considering voting for Sleepy Joe. <laughs> Cut the military budget like we've been asking you to do for six or seven decades since, you know, Eisenhower warned us of this cliff. We're already almost over. I mean, genocide is being supported by a government that uh, is supposed to secure the blessings of liberty and form a more perfect union, that's inexplicably unacceptable to your average gum-chewing American. Uh, you go into working-class communities, they're so infuriated at both these parties that they don't know what to do. And uh, the hubris, the arrogance, the lack of connection to ordinary people is so extreme that they just don't realize that the values of the people can't be discarded. Like during the Roosevelt administration, long live imagination. It's not long live the ruling class. It's long live imagination, the saying that I began this talk with. I don't see any imagination from Donald Trump's or Joe Biden's at all. I don't see any imagination coming out of the DNC and the RNC. Uh, if they want to pass the Latanya Reed's Freedom Act, a federal bill that's the most bipartisan bill I have yet to hear about that would give people with disabilities uh, the opportunity, the enforcement mechanism supporting that opportunity, the funding and the prioritization from a federal level to live in community-based settings and live independently, uh, the last administration didn't pass the Latanya Reeves Act. In the final year of the last Democratic administration, it was called the Disability Integration Act. They failed to pass it. Now they've had three years to pass that bill. So they both had four years to pass what I can see as the most bipartisan bill in history and is near and dear to my heart because that's been my career since 1992, providing care and service and guidance and support and health to people with disabilities at home in the community. So it is personal to me how both uh, members of the ruling class are, uh, you know, the emperor wears no clothes. It's shocking if you go behind the curtain like my dad did, and that was 40 years ago to find out how uh, these people have no honor, honor, no dignity, no trustworthiness, no peacefulness. I mean, you know, they feel like they're just going to move to another planet if there's genocide happening all over the world. Okay. Uh, these are not public officials. These are criminals. All right. Well, what point of order, Tim? All right. Uh, you can be fined. I don't know what you're talking about. You can be fined over $100,000 100, for discriminating against the handicapped person. Well, that's uh, a baker's dozen, Charlie. Let's move on to the next question. Tell the
Kelvin, you had your hand up. Go ahead and speak. Kelvin! Yeah, um, Thatcher. Love you yeah. guys. It's just Thatcher was that. Yeah, I'll catch my, my, my first off, um, a little bit of advice uh, from across the pond. I wouldn't wear a hat like that before Easter. Um, uh, <laughs> but my my question to you is: Do you not think that? Um, and, and don't get me wrong, I was never a fan of Maggie Thatcher. All right, um, I see you Americans were a fan of Maggie Thatcher. We didn't like it very much yet. Um, but what, would you not concede that one of their more far-sighted decisions was closing the coal mines? Whenever you close a job that is the entire structure of the community, you better have a replacement for that job. So those people who gave their blood, sweat, and tears to but, the yeah. community, you need to have a replacement. So yeah, close the coal mine. Yeah, well, um, I mean, with, bear, in, bear in mind her husband was an oil executive. And um, you know, you, we all know that the oil companies knew about global warming. Jackets before the rest of us got got got, got lit in on in on a secret. Um, do you not think it might have been a far sighted decision as opposed to? Uh, I, 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 of course, it was a political and uh, economic decision. But do you think it might have had some? Uh, it might have had a little bit far, a little bit of far sightedness as well. Uh, I think they would have closed something that was uh, good for the environment if it wasn't profitable. I think they don't care about the workers. We're just disposable to them. We're the scenery, we're props. Uh, you can see with the railroad workers strike here in this country uh, not too long ago, they just wanted sick days and the government didn't want to give them sick days. I mean, what kind of inhuman position is that to take? Uh, it's the same thing uh, with the coal mines. Uh, People, human beings, carbon-based life forms, earthlings, uh, you don't just turn off their button and then they're not a problem anymore, like a television set or a radio or a record player or a washing machine or an oven. Uh, they have families. So, I mean, you got to have something that their quality of life continues after those uh, jobs are closed down and you find something that can live in a balance with biosphere so that it's environmentally sound so you're good to the planet and you're also good to the people you know jonathan he, kelvin makes a good point over a third of the cost of the coal mines was being fronted by the government to keep the price down and what was that a good use of government money to keep the coal miners running the thing is you could put all those guys in a dole for the less money than what they were using on those coal mines yeah, I mean, it's a problem from hell. I don't think it's a minor problem. Uh, you have to uh, practice reducing your carbon footprint. Uh, you have to practice birth control. And uh, you have to have that as part of uh, widespread health care programs from the very beginning of uh, every person's life. Uh, they should have family planning, counseling, and just understand uh, just save for 10 years and have one kid and then save for maybe four or five years and have two kids and reduce your carbon footprint as best you can. It's a problem from hell when it comes to the environment because it's going to come back to bite us if we're not very, very, very frugal and very, very proactive and very, very uh, able to become small, stop expanding, become big. It's fun less. Uh, and you find out that the everyday things in life that don't cost any money and don't take energy actually are the most important things that bring us closer with uh, our family and our friends and our neighbors. We don't need to overdevelop and expand as much as we have. It's just madness because, you know, the earth is not an infinite reservoir of energy. We have to just acknowledge the fact that maybe 8 billion people is maximum capacity. We should slam on the brakes now because this eight billion is going to remain even with family planning and birth control and reducing the consumption of living most of their lives. We know that from countless studies, uh, we have to start to share more and coexist okay. more okay. and be okay with that because that's 
are ticket to survive. Okay, I'm going to let Kelvin continue because you you got some stronger. Go ahead. Well, I think he's, he's, uh, I think he speaks full into the usual trap of equating a uh, high population with high cons consumption. The actual fact, if you look at the demographics, it is the countries with the least. Uh, growing populations. It's one of the smaller, falling populations uh, that consume the most. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and the and it's it's the third world countries with the with a with a higher birth rate that consume the least. Um, yeah, well, I agree with yeah, that. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah. But actually, well, do you know what? Okay, do you, are you guys consume as much as Mexico? I don't think so. Per capita, um, you know, as Mexico consume as much as you guys? I don't think so. All right. um, the, the, the demographics of both of all Western countries is falling. We're all we're all below we're all below two. Uh, below two children, we're generally about what one point six, okay. I think. Okay, Kelvin, uh, we're going to let you rebut that, Jonathan. Then the next question is going to be Andy. Hey, Jonathan. Allow it, Andy. Can you comment? Good to see you, Andy. Do you have a comment on what could be done to account for our military budget? They brought it home and spent the money here. How would it improve uh, the lives of young children and Americans? We could modify housing, workspaces. Repeat the question, Jonathan. Uh, if we cut the military budget significantly, how much? 40%? 50%? <laughs> and Dennis Kucinich has said we could cut it by 30 to 40%. We'd still be the most protected military nation on earth. I mean, we have a neighbor to both sides of us. Uh, south and north who are friendly to us and we have two oceans so i mean we're not vulnerable right oh yes we might we be are. vulnerable internally but from external forces we're, we're pretty well protected as far as how much we spend on i don't know how wisely that military is utilized by dc uh powers of feet but i'd like to see it spent on health care education affordable housing human services especially a focus on community-based services for people with disabilities so they can live independently in their own homes and get away from nursing institutions with just warehousing our brothers and sisters in completely unlivable uh conditions where they become unpersons basically when they're in a nursing home as opposed to a community-based setting which just takes a little bit more planning a little bit more funding to make that possible you know uh, the disability community <coughs> is the most loyal community back to the economy when you give them a chance when you give them an employment opportunity, uh, it's off the charts. The studies on this are how uh, back to the economy, uh, the contribution is immediately. When people with disabilities and seniors and veterans and people with injuries get a job, uh, they say thank you with their time, their money, and their energy in a way that is absolutely exemplary of the best of America. So I'd like to see it go in those areas. And I think the Progressive Caucus pretty much suggests day of the year and both the right and the left ignores it. Okay, who's got yeah. the next question? Who's got the next question? Anybody, Justin? Okay, uh, anybody else out there? Otherwise, we're going to um, go to report. Charlie, go ahead. All right, Charlie, go ahead. You raised your hand. Get the next question. Unmute Charlie and let's get your next yeah, question. Where, where is he? He's there. He's right there. Go ahead, Charlie. All right, Jonathan. When the pioneers like Vane Lincoln came to Illinois, they didn't have all these government programs, a government program regulating every aspect of their lives, and they seemed to do okay. They built a real nice country. Why all of a sudden do we need all this regulation of every aspect? Of, is there any aspect of life you don't want to regulate? I don't have a time machine like you do, Charlie, but if I did, and I went back to have a conversation with beloved Abe for a couple hours under a tree on a sunny summer afternoon, uh, and I told them what both the RNC and the DNC and the Republican Party and the DNC has done not only to our communities in Illinois, but the United States and also North America and beyond the hemisphere, the entire earth right now. Uh, 
A would be this. So uh, I can only guess how uh, he would be appalled at the shamelessness of our current leaders. In regards to your question, more specifically in regards to regulation, yes, we should have more regulation in all kinds of areas, starting with Wall Street, the military industrial complex, uh, the corrupt corporate transnational corporations that committed 15 you know, trillion dollars of waste, fraud, and abuse in 07, 08. Uh, you just go down the list of why I'm all for regulation of the one percent. Yeah, I'm all for it. Uh, little do you see uh, how much we, the people, wanted those regulations to go, and they quickly put on the brakes and just offer some real modest examples of larger crumbs. If you saw real regulations on when you can start a war and how you can pay for it, all those folks who think that war is so wonderful in the last 50 years would have had to go fight it themselves. And they have to pay for it themselves. Oh, yeah. And they realize that maybe after they fought it themselves and paid for it themselves and their sons and daughters died in all those madness examples, uh, that it was also against international law how they conducted those wars. So I'm fed up with the two parties. Uh, I've tried my whole life to love them, but they didn't love back my community, my family. And just to get personal, uh, my mom voted uh, for these people her whole life. She's an operating room nurse. She took as much overtime as they could give her. Uh, she had multiple sclerosis, half of her career, which is hard as hell if you're having insomnia as a nurse providing care for patients all morning, noon, and night to pay for rent for your two sons. Uh, they still don't think that nurses, not the general population, 340 American, uh, million Americans, just nurses, they don't think they should have single payer health care. You know, they can go to hell for that. Uh, they think that uh, the disability community demands for people with disabilities to have a little bit of more help to live independently in the community for their retirements is not worth their time compared to financially, militarily, and legally supporting genocide, they can go to hell. And one more thing about that. Uh, when you have somebody who so faithfully votes for you their whole career, and all they want you to do is reflect your values in public policy, and you act like it's naive or childish or not financially viable or not the way the real world works. That pretty much says who you are as a human being if you ever met Linda Barton in Villa Park, Illinois. You don't deserve to be in power or wealth or influence and all you people who are in power over the last 50 years, go to hell. So you want federal employees? to control the entire U.S. economy? Uh, that would be a start. Well, uh, Jonathan, wasn't that called a five years plan? And uh, wasn't that also called something called communism uh, under are you, Stalin? Are you a communist? I'm a democracyist, and everybody knows that at the College of Complexes. I don't go to any totalitarian extremes. I'm right here at the center where Eugene Debs was and where Martin Luther King Jr. was and where Emma Goldman was and well, where uh, Judy Human was in democracy mixed with humanism, we the peopleism, socialism. I'm not afraid to say the S word because I lived in Northern Europe and it wasn't the boogeyman. It was just a better way of providing everybody with an equal piece of the pie. Uh, you know, it's, there's nothing wrong with even having communists in your government. They do that in Europe. And you know what that means? A lot more actual real talk dialogues happen from what the people really scare the hell out of Washington. Democracy is. That's what they're most afraid of. And that's why they use totalitarian uh, boogeymen to scare the hell out of people. Every time we talk about a little bit more to the left, a la Bernie Sanders, a la Dennis Kucinich, a la Shama Sawan. You know, a communist is a democratic socialist whose life was in danger from fascists. I, I'm lucky 
that my life has never been in danger as a democratic socialist. But I'll tell you something right now. If somebody tried to hunt me down the way Reagan had those death squads hunt down nuns and priests and human rights organizers and union organizers in the 80s, I would have no choice to say the enemy of my enemy is my ally, not my best friend, but my ally, at least the not being murdered or assassinated. Is there anything good about the United so States, like Jonathan? A, a government that is of democracy is 90%. But if we have to let 3 or 4% of communists or anarchists in there and we have 90% democracy, is, I would love to live in that country where it's 90% democracy. Is. And all I'm saying is uh, what the preamble says. You know, when I read it in the beginning, I, I believe in securing the blessings of liberty and forming a more perfect union. That's all a democracy wants. The democracy is one. Is there anything good about the United States, Jonathan? Uh, I still live here, so obviously this is the greatest country in the history of the world that I could not express uh, with all my fiber in my being how lucky I am, especially this year having a job at my uh, place that's a dream job to be where we can help people every day. Uh, this is the greatest country in the world. We have the greatest capacity to improve, to be the envy of the rest of the democracies on earth. But we aren't exercising it right now under the two major parties. So that's why we got a vote no confidence vote. And okay. uh, let, just to uh, briefly talk about this poster here of Nelson Mandela voting uh, after being in prison for decades for basically exercising his human rights to be a human. Uh, his personal assistant is there next to him. And, uh, you know, Nelson Mandela was demonized as being pro-Castro and pro-Cuba because uh, they advocated for his uh, release from prison and the end to apartheid. It's always the democracyists in history who are labeled all these extremist things when they're not that. They just see fascism for what it is, a bunch of projecting quacks. All right, Charlie, last question. Just a quick one. Uh, uh, Jonathan, I guess you think it's okay if federal employees are, are card-carrying communists, members of the Communist Party? Did you hear that, Jonathan? Charlie's case is pointed at me today. Uh, repeat your question, Charlie. I'd like to know if he thinks it's okay for federal employees to be card carrying members of the Communist Party, okay. USA. Well, what if they're card carrying members of we're tired of having all our money go to our own debt? Which any person in a working class community in this country will tell you that's their analysis over the last 15 years. You reap what you the communist, we will bury you. You reap what you sow. If you have a government that's a corrupt, treasonous government, you're going to get people who are furious and ready to system change. They're going to advocate for the removal of that unjust group of people who are running their government and have hijacked it away from them and their spouses and their children and their fellow neighbors who are peaceful, loving, equality supporting, democracy practicing, transparency supporting, justice supporting, and a civilization that wants to be coexisting together in peace. People. They're not going to have a people who are going to be like lemmings going over the cliff at this point in time after Ukraine and supporting genocide, people are ready to peacefully, democratically mass mobilize for assemblies all over the country that'll make Occupy Wall Street look like a preseason practice. Okay. At this point, we're going to go to rebuttals. Who's got rebuttals? Please raise your hand online. If you got something, let me know. All right, you want to go up there? Uh, uh, we got Andy, we got, um, okay, so we got three people here. Anybody online? I'll each give you about five, maybe six minutes. All right, so go ahead, David, get up there and let's uh, 
speak. And anybody online too, you're more than welcome to join in. I know Charlie will uh, have his two cents later on, and Kelvin too. First All right. One, I do not consider the Democratic Party. A little louder, David. I do not consider the Democratic Party to be as evil or more evil than the Republican Party. Nothing is more evil than Donald Trump. And as far as I'm concerned, to take Joe Biden to keep him out of office, you bet you I'm going to vote for Joe Biden this year. Period. End of story. Second, I noticed that, you know, that um, Jonathan did not answer my question about Robert Oppenheimer. And I wanted to know from Jonathan was what his father's views were on the denial of Dr. Oppenheimer's security clearance and the fact that the government kept hunting him because he was trying to control Congress police. That was the basis on which his security something that was later reversed uh, in 2022 by Energy Secretary after he died? Yes. Until it was reinstated. Finally, Louis Strauss, who organized denial of the security clearance, well, his appointment to serve as Commerce Secretary under President Eisenhower became one of the few cabinet appointments to be rejected by the U.S. Senate. It was practically that reason. What goes around a company. Okay. Who's next? Andy, you want to go next? All right, Charlie, you want to do your rebuttal real quick? Is anybody ready now? Uh, go ahead, Charlie. Right, I know Dave. Uh, uh, why don't you go ahead, Justin? Go ahead and give your rebuttal. All right, we're going to let Justin go. Kelvin, if you're ready, you're next. All right, five minutes, Justin. Take your time. Uh, Justin did a very good talk today. Uh, he's always his talks are usually pretty good and entertaining. And uh, even if I don't always agree, uh, but the Libertarian Party of Illinois is having its convention March eighth and ninth at the Clarion Inn in Elmhurst, and uh, we're having a presidential debate. Maybe some of the more uh, conspiracy people in here might. Uh, be thrilled to know that Art Olivier is a candidate this year and will be there. So, if you think 9 11 is an inside job, he's your guy. What's his name again? Art Olivier. But also, uh, Chase Oliver will be there for just one. The Libertarian uh, Straw Poll in Iowa, which is administered by the Secretary of State's office in Iowa. So, it's not just like, oh, Straw Poll. Uh, Mike and Re Michael Reckonwald will be there as well, as far as Mike Termont, who's visited the Chicago chapter. Uh, and uh, Joshua Rodriguez will be there. Jacob Hornberger uh, will be there as well. If I'm missing anybody. Where's this week? March 8th and 9th at the Clarion oh, Hotel. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Any references to Jonathan's talk or his policies? Uh, I mean, I don't. I think me and Jonathan have a lot of the same like ends, but different means, and and uh, you know, like that's. I, I was very happy to hear that he suggested like mm -hmm. voting for libertarians. Yeah, I'm so, voting for libertarians. So if you really, if you really want to stick it to the establishment, March nineteenth uh, at the primary election. Full libertarian ballot, you can vote for our statewide candidates uh, who are uh, uh, Charles Kapinski for state's attorney and then Michael Murphy for clerk of the circuit court. We also got Jim Humane who's running uh, as a ward committee person and as the first district uh, county board seat that Brandon Johnson vacated. Uh, and then uh, I will be part of a inaugural class of ward committee persons in Chicago. This is the first uh, election that uh, you can vote for ward committee people in Chicago. And I'm going to be happy to be part of that inaugural class. I already mentioned Jim Humane, but also Danny Lewis will be. Uh, 
a Ward 3 person against the Ward, as well as Nico Satsuas, who was the Cook County tax assessor candidate uh, in 2022. So, pull a libertarian ballot on uh, March 19th at the primary election. Come see me here. Uh, I guess that is the 15th or 16th, whatever it is. The, the, the Saturday before the primary, I will be here. I'll have Chris Laron, who was here uh, prior to his election on the police district council. He'll be back to join me. We'll talk about more about the upcoming primary election. And then a couple weeks after that, I will be also back. I'm doing a slideshow uh, date libertarian meme stash. <laughs> I don't know. I think I'm going to try to change the name of it to make it more, you know, clever or something. But I'll have a slideshow libertarian meme. So uh, hope to see you guys there. <laughs> All right. Uh, Kelvin, you're next. Your rebuttal, please. Okay. Um, first off, uh, I'll answer Bob's question what was wrong with Reaganomics? Um, Reaganomics uh, deregulated ec economics to the uh, degree that it was responsible for the, it was a knock-on effect. A lot of it was kicking cans down the road. I don't know if you know about that. We increased the debt and you and, and you, uh, you, you pushed any economic problems further down the road. So it was, it was directly responsible for future uh, crashes like in uh, 86 and in 2008. And it also uh, destroyed the unions to such a degree that the millennials now look at The Simpsons as complete or not a fiction on the fact that a man who could just have a high school education and one job support a family of, of three children and a, and a stay at home wife. Um, that's just complete fiction nowadays. That doesn't happen anymore. Um, as for regulation, I've worked for all, most of my life in construction um, and I, as, as an independent contractor which uh, I have to add, I have never needed a license for in Britain, unlike the land of the free. Um, so, but uh, that's, a, that's beside the wrong point. What happens with regulations is, regulate, people want to have to get deregulated, deregulated, get the job done faster, get the job done cheaper, get the job done, done, done quicker, and unless there's too many regulations, it just, it just gets in the way until buildings start to fall down, and then suddenly people realize there was a reason for those regulations. Regulations are not the, are, are not the enemy. It's how those regulations are implemented, implemented and what, where they are regulated. regulated. When you say um, regulations, there was regulations in the time of, uh, 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 of the founding fathers. The fourth thing that they did regulate it was the currency, which the, uh, which the, uh, the family, which the uh, revolutionary uh, governments uh, it, uh, printed as if there was no, no, no tomorrow and it was practically worthless um, by, by, by the end of it. One thing that was, was regulated was uh, British currency, which was of sterling silver and, had, uh, and, 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 and French uh, currency, which was, uh, was of silver. You could count upon sterling silver. Uh, it was regulated. Um, so it's one of those, isn't it? Um, you, pay, you take your choice. We we uh, we all want um, everything deregulated until something goes wrong, and then we'll say, and then we said because people didn't uh, follow the regulations. All right, that's that's me. Thank you. Okay, Kelvin, who's next? Andy, you want to go? Okay. Uh... Can I take thirty seconds to present Mr. Bowser and Mr. Charlie with something of my appreciation? For what yes. Uh, it's the King holiday, so I, I brought this uh, famous quote by King and a picture of him. Ooh. Let us all hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched communities. And some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood and sisterhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. The first for the cause of peace, Brotherhood and Sisterhood, Martin Luther King Jr. Tim and Charlie, thank you for keeping this forum one of the only kinds of it in America alive. I salute you once again. Happy 2024, Tim and Charlie. Thank you very much, Jonathan. <laughs> okay, next. Who else wants to talk? All right, uh, Charlie, go ahead. Uh, 
Andy. All right. First of all, let's thank Jonathan for putting together a, a nice presentation on a variety of topics. I guess everyone can hear me, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Number one, Jonathan, I've been following Congress for many, many years. And the Democrats, Democratic Party is not identical to the Republican Party. If you look at the legislation that's advanced and opposed by either party, there's a radical, particularly obvious difference between the two regarding policy. So anybody who says that they are identical is mis entirely mistaken. Uh, I, I even subscribe to certain measures in this regard of voting patterns and the legislation that any of them I can plug in. It's a matter of fact, it's amazing how they are in fact divided between two opposing parties. This is what we have right now. Not two identical parties but two radically different parties. And it's incumbent upon us to vote for the correct party, not nullify two of them. That's like eating your own seed corn. Now, the second thing I'd like to say is, is that you're complaining about laws and so forth that have not been passed. Now, all current policy and all legislation is entirely a matter of compromise. You have to, so to speak, cut a deal to vote for legislation that you're not in favor of in order to get the other guy to vote for your legislation that he may not be in favor of. You just can't wave a magic wand and get all that you want. This is not like Christmas, that you get whatever you want. There are very few, in fact, laws that are passed, but you gotta cut a deal. If you vote for something you don't particularly in favor of, why should you? And the other guys, well, they, you have to get them to support your legislation <laughs> in order to get something done. Otherwise, you're going to have complete stagnation. And that's taking a hard line may sound wonderful from the podium. Oh, blah, blah, blah. But it's not going to get anything done. It's not going to, you're not going to get any legislation passed by coming in and thumping on the podium or claiming some sort of moral high ground or things that should be done. Because there are people out there who think that perhaps there are things that not, should not be done. They may be incorrect. They may be wrong. They may be seeking their own gain or preserving their own power positions. That's not going to be, you can't eliminate that. For whatever reason, they're going to stand in opposition to what you want to get done. It's a complex process. Also, then again, we heard a little bit there. Not only is it difficult to get a law passed, you have to have somebody to enact it, a president, an executive office. You may not, you may just uh, slow walk through a legislation, never really enforce it. And also then, it may have challenges in the Supreme Court that will nullify it altogether and you're going to have to start all over again. I wish it were a little bit different. I wish we could alleviate suffering. You take an issue here like you want to, I like this one. You, you cited an example, you guys, about the U.S. military budget. As it stands, the entire Republican Party, every single member of Congress, is an advocate of the high... Uh, military budget and you are not going to you have to say well 
What can I get you to come down on this? What can what would you say? That's what I mean. If I vote for your high military budget, what are you going to do in turn for me as a Democrat? So that's what I mean. That's the process that's going on. You may not like it, but at the end of the day, it's sometimes the things that have to be done. There's trade-offs. And very often there are peculiar trade-offs. But it's difficult to get legislation to a committee. Like here, you want to oppose the military budget. Republicans are in charge of the committee structure. If you want to introduce a law, they will block every single one of them in committee. And you will not get one law passed. I don't know if that's achieving anything or gets you anywhere. Might make you feel good, but it's not going to get one single law passed in any fashion. Also, I'm not certain about this law that you were advocating for the disabled people. It's on your use Freedom Act. But it was my experience on the law right now, and has been for a long, long time, that if you are a victim of discrimination on the basis of a handicapping condition, you can, in fact, take legal action against the offending party. You were found, if that offending party is found guilty, you can be awarded or penalize them upwards of a hundred thousand dollars only. Right. And you will have free legal assistance in doing so. Now that's been around a long time. I don't know what the flaw is in this regard. That mechanism has been around for many, many years. Now Anything in these cases certainly take time, and there's going to be the typical stalling efforts on the on the legal actions, and you're going to have to persevere. Perhaps I'm not saying it's not going to be easy, but the mechanism does exist. When they pass that legislation, in order to make it effective, there was a monetary penalty for those who offended. That is very, very rare. In labor law, employers are not, don't face a, a monetary penalty for violating labor laws. You don't realize how unusual that in fact is. It is very strong incentive for compliance with the law or settlements in that regard. Believe you me, I've been achieving settlements using that legislation for years and years and years representing disabled employees. So I, not that I'm opposed to your legislation, I'll look into it further, but there's significant apparatus already enabling legislation. I thought, I didn't know there was anything that was prohibiting a, a detriment to the disabled, so that's why I'm going to look into it. Anyhow, thank you, Jonathan, and I hope you, uh, Come back again, and maybe things will improve. I, I, I'm pleased to see that you are in a total agreement with me that it's totally appropriate for federal employees to be communists. I applaud that at your efforts in that regard. Thank you. Happy 2024, Charlie. Okay, uh, Andy, if you're ready, go ahead. All right, Andy, we got we got you up to five minutes there, sir. A little leeway if you need to go a little longer. That's fine, Andy. Okay. Thanks, Jonathan. Good talk. A whole bunch of stuff that's uh, in the reading pack. We got about four hours of the reading here and the handouts you gave us tonight. We appreciate the research. A few points I'd like to make. Uh, Since, since about 1960, when Eisenhower warned us about the military industrial complex, we've been living in greater and greater mythology promoted by the mainstream media. And the, the term conspiracy nut was coined, propagated by our CIA 
for anybody that talked about uh, questioning the official story of Lee Harvey Oswald killing John Kennedy. Uh, on the website called Want to Know Info, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Global Research. Global Research from Canada has an article by Judith, um, Judith Woodward, Elizabeth Woodward. She was a writing partner with David Ray Griffin, who wrote 14 books on the forensic evidence of 9 11. And her article is entitled, uh, What We Know Now That We Didn't Know Then About the Assassinations of Kennedy. The Kennedys, Martin Luther King, and Malcolm X. All of those assassinations were done by uh, people with ties to the American military and CIA. There was no lone gunman, lone nuts uh, like Lee Harvey Oswald involved in any of those assassinations. Those men were killed because they were talking about moving America toward, toward peace and prosperity for the masses and a better standard of living rather than continuing uh, down the military path, making more and more profits to the military industrial complex. Some of the big myths we've been talked about, I mean, we were told that nuclear power would be clean, safe, and too cheap to meter. Well, nuclear power bankrupted every utility that tried to sell kilowatts to pay for the plants. The, the utilities that survived were all propped up with state money government money and they were tied to the military industrial complex, nuclear power, nuclear weapons. Uh, they use the same uranium mining machinery, milling, all you know, it's two, two sides of the same coin. The world is heading away from that now. Reaganomics, we were told the trickle down theory would improve the lives of everybody. Well, the lives of middle class Americans have gotten steadily worse relatively since 1980, since Ronald Reagan was installed in the Oval Office. And incidentally, uh, Tom Hartman talks about that. No Republican since Eisenhower has officially been elected in a fair election. They've all been involved in some kind of treason or criminal activity to suppress the vote, change the vote, uh, lie to the American people. It's been one treasonous act after another to get Republicans or criminals masquerading as Republicans installed in the White House. Since from 2016 to 2020, I've been saying we had no president. We had no president in this country. We had a long time mobbed up corporate criminal masquerading as a president and wearing the presidential suit. Trump was number one in two categories for people that haven't studied it. Trump was runaway number one in two categories. Number one, you have to have a certain amount of education, uh, political skill, uh, aptitude, integrity, you have to have a certain number of things in your personality to qualify you to do the job as president. Trump had none of those things, number one. Number two, there's a certain, if you commit certain types of crimes uh, or unethical behavior or a wide range of things, any one of those things can get you voted out, removed and impeached and removed. Trump had all of that. Trump should have been chucked out of office within 72 hours of when he was installed in the 2016 election. But let's move on from there. I'm a Vietnam veteran, and I've, I've spent the last 50 years of my life basically trying to do something constructive for humanity. After I got out of the Army, I realized I participated. I was used as part I was part of the largest killing machine in human history. The U.S. Army is not defending freedom and justice anywhere on the planet. It's a killing machine that clears off the land and moves people away from resources that are coveted by American corporations. General Butler said he didn't realize until he retired in 1935, a famous Marine general. He said, I didn't realize that I was the leader of a mob. I mean, uh, we, were, we we detected the mob. We made we made the world safe from the mob. And we're not talking about the mafia here. We're talking about United Fruit Company, Standard Oil. He said we we, we operated on three continents. And <clears throat> his book, War is a Racket, describes how wars are used by corporations to prop up their stock prices. 
is one day after you took over in the war, you no longer make 10 or 8 or 10 percent profit on clothing or anything else, 8 percent profit per ton on steel. When you go on a wartime footing, then you start getting 100 percent, 200 percent profit per ton of the same thing you used to sell two days earlier. That's what happens in wartime. For those people that can't handle the truth on 9-11, the database on what happened on 9-11 is as solid as the database on cigarette smoking or asbestos. There's no debate about what happened on 9-11. And the courts are simply stonewalling lawsuits. Uh, the slam dunk case has been put together with all the evidence and sent to uh, the district courts, uh, district attorney in New York, because that's where it happened. And they uh, they want to investigate the people that packed the explosives in all seven buildings. Seven buildings were destroyed in the event known as 9-11. Four came down on 9-11. The other three were left with big holes and everything else, the standing rubble. They were brought down by big cranes in a hurry uh, at a few days later. The whole site was roped off so that no investigative reporters could get in there with cameras and film the destruction uh, showing how the girders were blown apart with high temperature explosives. The two twin towers didn't collapse. There was no collapsing going on in the twin towers from the plane crashes. The twin towers, each one of them, went sideways in a wind as a big cloud of dust after being converted from the top down with layers of explosives. You can see it in the films, it's been recorded, studied by hundreds of physicists, thousands of other researchers. There's no debate on what happened on 9-11. The debate in the country is now how long we are gonna about allow our corrupt judges to continue to stonewall the lawyers that are bringing cases before the court to investigate and prosecute the people that did it. Who's gonna testify? That they did it. Joe, I'm full at a time, Charlie. Let's do you have anyone to testify that they did it? All right, John. I, I, I like the answer. Uh, Ch Charlie keeps saying nobody has come forward to admit uh, that they did it. Can you imagine what our country would be like if you ask, a, ask the police to investigate the murder? We have the, the smoking gun the body and it has bullet holes and then they're at the crime scene and the, the police chief says, well, we're not going to investigate until the killer comes forward and said, I did it. What would that do to our police departments? Would we, would we have any justice at all if, if the police would wait wait for the criminals to come forward and say we did it before you had an investigation? That, that, that line of thinking is laughable on its face. So, you know, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll call on anybody that keeps promoting the idea that 9-11, uh, the collapse of the buildings and the destruction, was uh, it's an opinion. It's not an opinion. It's an established fact, like smoking four packs a day is not good for your health. A thousand years ago, you could debate whether the earth was flat or round. Today, the answer is no. You can't debate that. How many guys said we're on the dynamite crew? All right, Charlie, we not one person said they were on the dynamite crew. Just mute that, please. Okay, Charlie, so uh, wait, 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 wait. That's why you have the mute button. Yeah. All right, go uh, ahead. Let's, go let's ahead. have a show of hands. I have a show of hands here in the room. Who knows uh, the, the, uh, what, what book is the number one blacked out book of all time? It's currently a national bestseller. The author, the, author, the publisher can't even buy ads in newspapers. <laughs> radio, television, they won't even take any ads to advertise the sale of a book that's a runaway bestseller. Usually if you sell two, 3,000 copies in a week or something, that's a bestseller. This one, this one sold 100,000 in the first couple of weeks and it's, it's up now beyond a million copies sold. It's a runaway bestseller for 22 weeks on the bestseller list. Does anybody know what that is? No. I mean, it's about a festo. It's called The Real Anthony Fauci, and it's published by Robert F. Oh, Kennedy, Jr. Oh, he's not. He's, he's, he's got a lot of 
he's in a line. He's in a lot of news because he's, he's telling censored. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. His book is being censored because he was telling the truth. When, he when he's not. Give his book up there. No, this one is the latest. This one is not being talked about either. It's called the Wuhan cover up. Hundreds of doctors, thousands of researchers are publishing papers weekly showing that the, the COVID virus most likely came from the Wuhan bioweapons lab that was funded by our American NIH. Okay. We moved the bioweapons research off. All right. Sure. I, one, one thing, one last thing. All right, Kelvin's going to say something afterwards. And I have a uh, just, uh, just, just, just show one. Uh, just yeah, a show one. Yeah, Excuse me, just a show one. Oh, let me let, give let, you let, a note. Let, I have a note for you. You're in England, right? So uh, you should look up a, a filmmaker, uh, a celebrated filmmaker that made several documentaries and films on the reality of the AIDS epidemic. Uh, the, the woman's name is called Joan Champion. She published a book called Positively False that tells the whole story of the hopes of the age yeah. of can I can I just can I just educate you on something? A thousand okay. years ago the there was no uh, Ted, please let me speak, please. Well, a thousand years ago there was no debate about whether the earth was was, was flat or not. They knew it was round. It was a it was American author by the name of Washington Irving that put that idea into, into people's heads. It's only nowadays with the onset of the of the internet. Do we get idiots that question such such obvious facts? What do you say? Question. A thousand years ago, people knew the world was round. They didn't question it. It's only nowadays when we have the idiocy of the uh, of, of the internet do we get such stupid bloody questions. Ten thousand years. Okay, well that, that it was a it was a fallacy that many people man thought the world was flat. Put, put about by the author Washington Irving. You know the guy who wrote Split Sleepy Hollow? That guy. All right, Kelvin, that's that's good. All right, we need to uh, go ahead and rebut. What, uh, yeah, did you have a question? No, he wants to rebut. No, 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 this is why you got ejected the last time. No, 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 no. And, and, Andy, Joe. Andy, are you done with me, buddy? Okay. Joe, go ahead. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Andy. It's all right. No problem. Get up there. And... Thanks There's so no qualifications to talk anything about public health. Zero. All right, uh, Charlie. I want to preface this by saying I didn't see Don I didn't see uh, Jonathan's entire uh, lecture. I wish I could see the beginning, but in general, um, so I just left the Libertarian Party and joined the Green Party. Um, so I, I'm kind of a blend of both at the time. I'm a Georgist, a mutualist, anarchist, and um, I'm. And I, I just want to start by commenting on something Charlie said. Uh, in case anyone's wondering, there is a federal law that says communists are not allowed to be government employees. That would be Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, 1964. But uh, what I wanted to talk about um, is why, and this is the subject, it's a nice presentation, why progressive legislation fails. And again, I didn't see all of Jonathan's presentation, but I want to comment on why, in general, I think progressive legislation fails. It's because we aren't paying close enough attention to the separation of powers. And I'm going to preface this by saying I'm glad Justin pointed out that um, Justin and Jonathan have some overlap in terms of goals, but we just disagree uh, slightly about how to get there. I think we should go to a point, a uh, place where we have a parliamentary democracy and we have a, a larger variety of parties, because that's what Europe is doing right about democracy. And if that means more communists, then that's great. If that means more fascists, that's acceptable as long as they're communists, because this is why people like communism in the 30s, 40s, 50s, because they were the only ones willing to fight fascists on the street. Whereas the socialists were just saying, well, let's get rid of this parliament here or there, and we'll run an election with them. You know, if you're going to have fair election, you need to have far, you need to go far enough to the left and to the right to have a, a better coverage of uh, you know people's different opinions. You might not like all, all the consequences of that, but that's what comes with supporting free speech and a truly liberal democracy. So to speak to the issue of why progressive legislation fails, in my opinion, it's because we aren't uh, respecting the separation of powers closely enough. And I, I understand and I identify with why progressives are uh, 
uh, frustrated that um, the federal legislation is not succeeding in um, in stopping the killing with the large military budget in favor of uh, stopping the killing and, and helping people live longer with uh, federal help. But the thing is that health, along with environment, ecology, retirement, social security, disabled people issue, it's not mentioned in the constitution. That doesn't mean we can't have that dealt with at the federal level. It just means we need to use the amendment process to have a formal amendment authorizing the national government to have exclusive authority over those areas of jurisdiction so that the state governments can stop them and have a conflict of interest where the federal government and state governments are fighting over who gets to regulate those things. So until we understand the 10th Amendment exists, it exists for a purpose and it's in place. Um, we also need to remember it doesn't say the states have, it doesn't say the states have rights. It doesn't say that explicitly. It just says anything not specifically delegated to the federal government is left up to the states or the people. It doesn't say the states and then the people. The people get to decide in their respective states how much control the states have over those issues. And Dr. Wood, Kelvin mentioned, you know, not every state requires every profession to get a license. He talked about uh, construction, contracting. There are states where you don't have to be a security guard, don't have to get a license in order to be a security guard. Each, uh, the people of each state can decide how much they want their government to regulate each profession. So we need to respect the separation of powers until we get an amendment saying that the federal government should regulate something instead of the states. And the three primary responsibilities of the federal government is what I call the three M's, uh, money, mail, and monetary policy. And what happened, this is how our government got out of control. We decided that we have to have a military. Then we have uh, in Article 1, Section 8, we have a provision providing for the federal government to own military lands, to have that military on and to have control of ports and things like that so we don't get attacked. And then, because of the D.C. Act of 1871 and other things, the federal, uh, the area of land that the federal government owns got completely out of control. So now we, now that we have all this land, now we have to use it. And then government got into uh, growing crops and having the Department of Agriculture was one of the first um, departments that we had that wasn't originally there in the founding. We only started with uh, four cabinet positions. Now there's about 15. And now that the government's, uh, federal government is regulating agriculture, then it started regulating health. And medicine. And before you all know it, we're getting forced to take the back, so we have masks on our faces. There's nothing in the Constitution about health or environment. It doesn't mean there can be. We just have to put it in there if we want it to be in there. So this is not to praise John Marshall in general because he was a slave owner, but one good thing he said, I believe it was in Marbury versus Madison, um, any law which is repugnant to the Constitution is invalid. So if you look up something called positive versus non-positive law, you'll find that there's about 50 sections of U.S. code, and only about half of them apply to all the people. And about half of them are optional, or they are only um, mandatory on certain populations of people, like government employees, uh, military, uh, active duty military, uh, immigrants, Native Americans, people who choose to be subjects to certain laws. There's a plenty of federal government laws that don't have to be obeyed by the people. And we're not told that because they don't want us to know that. So most of the federal government's powers are being enforced now because people think that having uh, federal health and the environment and social security is necessary and proper to execute the foregoing powers of having a military and mail system and monetary power. But it's really not. It's a matter of opinion what is necessary and proper to be part of a federal government. If we just change public opinions or make people realize that all these extra laws are unnecessary and improper, then we'll change the <laughs> of this <laughs> So you have to pursue legislation at the correct level of government, or you have to get an amendment, or else you wind up with a giant federal government. And it may be, it may look more efficient. Oh, you just change the federal government, you can change the whole country really quickly. Well, what happens if you lose the election? Then the party that you hate will eventually come into power every four or eight years, and they'll destroy all the gains that you've had over the last four or eight or even 40 years. So I support 70 to 90% of the progressive agenda. Uh, I, I wish um, 
disenchanted Bernie Sanders voters love. I wish the Green Party love. I wish the Libertarians love too. But you have to keep in mind to respect the separation of powers and the amendment process and to pursue legislative change at the correct level of government before you should expect uh, failure. That's a rebuttal. All right, Jonathan. We got one more rebuttal. Clark's going to give one last rebuttal. I'll bring the mic. Can I give a second rebuttal? After Clark, yes. Okay, uh, let me. Uh, all right, take take the. Okay, Clark, go ahead. My subject Clark, I am doing the experiment. And said, you had neighbors with having said about a table that was the jail. That's a reality, but you know, it doesn't mean they can't improve it. They um we can't we haven't it's good to this the next fifty dollars for some thing. So it's just a big way to get the boulders because of the like the bill but two that's not used.
All right, um, I'm, I, because of time, I'm going to just let uh, Jonathan finish his rebuttal, okay? All right, Jonathan. Oh, yeah, Tim, Tim, you got five minutes? Uh, I don't got a long stick to say after. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I don't need to rebut. Did you want to make your two minute rebuttal or whatever it was? Okay, Jonathan, just take your rebuttal. Go at least to two or three minutes or thereabouts, and uh, you'll get the last word, and then uh, we'll get out of here after that. Um, so go ahead. The founder of the College of Complexes, Slim Brundage, wrote this in the curriculum. Uh, over 60 years ago. <clears throat> 25 years ago in the Dill Pickle Club, we'd kick the gong around on this and that. We'd wear out one subject after another. Sounds familiar. Then about two years later, some wise guy would publish the cogent and startling thoughts which he just discovered and we've forgotten about. Sounds familiar. So I pro prognosticate that in a year or two, some brain will discover that all radicals ain't dead yet. Amen to that. This is a gag. I'm always saying I'm the only real radical around this joint. The reason is that I got Karl Marx with my first spoonful of oatmeal. I just miss getting myself 14 years in stir by being in the Wobbly Hall in Centralia, Washington in 1919. My old man campaigned with Eugene Debs for social security, child labor laws, eight hours for women, old age assistance, unemployment insurance, public ownership of utilities, and women's suffrage. If the good people of that day didn't openly hate him, they thought he was a dreamer. Sounds familiar. But he and a million other dreamers wrote the Socialist Party platform of 1912. Out of 23 planks in that platform, 18 had become the law of the land, which I'm sure the orange chair clown and sleepy JP would love to undo all. Now the good middle class kids who inhabit the college of complexes can laugh at songs we sang, like the white slave, or we have fed you all for a thousand years in solidarity forever. But who made the soft beds they lie in? Where would they be today without the damn radicals like my old man? So what has become of all the radicals? What happened to the 40 open forums Chicago used to boast? Good question. Why are there no more than three open air forums in the whole of America? Have all the frontiers been won? Are people no longer interested in making this a better world? Don Alexander, a sociologist who attends the College of Complexes, suggested that the radicals were operating in a different era. Sure. Most everything that was radical in my youth is accepted now. The types who took to the soapbox were the ones who battled on the economic front, but the radical is still with us. He is still going to jail for what he or she believes, but the radical ain't where they belong. That's why we think the radical is dead. Webster says a radical is one who advocates radical and sweeping changes with the least delay. My own definition is, one whose avocation is the building of a better world. Um, I, uh, what did I want to say? Uh, I love it when uh, Andy says Wuhan as much as I love it when Charlie says Gizmo. That's what I remember. <laughs> you got to go back to one of the previous programs last week. If we choose to indulge in the narrow minded ideas of cynics on both sides of the political spectrum of the two major political parties in this country, 
of what the rule of law we speak. We will continue to fail to reach our goals to defend her, we will continue to fail to reach our goals to assist her, we will continue to fail to reach our goals to support her, and we will continue to fail to reach our goals that she can be free. In order to cultivate a new structure for how we all live, we must dream beyond the dream limit, think beyond the thought limit, speak beyond the speech limit, act beyond the action limit, mobilize and unite without fear until we the people of Earth win. Long live imagination. Thank you for your crazy complexity collegians for being here on the coldest weekend of the year. I'm so glad that we're still standing and uh, looking forward to Kathy Powers next week. Talk about disability issues in public transit in the city of Chicago. We are hereby adjourned. Yeah, we'll stop. Amy, was threatening you with exposure the form of censorship? No. I didn't threaten you with exposure. Told you that's what happened to you when you made a scene the last time. It wasn't my fault. Who wants an elephant? Who wants a donkey? I've got elephants and donkeys. Who wants them? I got to have less to carry out. Well, just follow the way you guys thought I wasn't going to My time was in the Elephant, donkey, or both? Okay, hey, is that it, Jonathan? I think that's it. All right, John. Would you like an elephant? Yeah. All right, that's it. That's it tonight. Dominic, would you come on up tonight, please? Yes. We'd like to. Uh, the first time here tonight as our wait as a waitress. Like Woo! Welcome Hi. everybody. Welcome. I'm gonna be your waitress now every Saturday. Just come on, guys. You gotta give a better way. Thank you. So, Have a good night. Thank, thank you very you. much. And uh, thank you. Would you come on up for a minute, here, Justin? Yeah. Thank you, Dominic. Bye. Thank you. Nice to I meet know, you. I know we had a couple of people who help out here a little bit. I just wanna thank publicly you. thank them. Dominic for one and Justin come on up here. I know you're helping a little bit tonight. There's uh Justin. Let's hear it for Justin real quick. Right. And Andy, okay, could you please come on up to him? Um, okay, well anyway, Andy Anderson's also yeah, been a great help tonight. Thank you. Um, anyway, with that, oh, yeah, we'll uh adjourn this uh so glad you're here. little uh journey into free well, speech. And as I said, yeah, it is right? one pool at a time and as it says in scripture, a whole is that just an understanding, but only the revealing of his own mind. Oh, you guys so we have a lot of minds revealed right? here. Thank you very much for attending. That and with that, our know? college of complexes okay. is now adjourned. Go in peace, serve slim rundage. Okay. Uh, to all the other free speech formats, or uh, free speech forums, follow us.